we go to the defense. Uh, I'll get the defensive line conversation started with this. We know Bear Alexander's an excellent player. That can't be debated. But is he going to become a star, like a, a national player this year? Is he going to become a dominant force consistently? I'm not going to try to elevate him to Indomitian Sioux type. You know, we're talking epic season, but, you know, a, a near first team All-American type of player that could be the difference between we know he's good. He's the, he's the given up front versus this guy's a wrecking crew kind of guy. Well, and last year, last year it was really just him in the middle. And he was consistently getting solid double teams consistently. Hoping this year they figured out, you know, with Coach Henny uh, to get him some help on the inside. He absolutely has the ability to be that guy and break out. And really, I just wrote something on it recently at Trojans Wire that the, the coaching staff is pretty much calling him out and saying, is, and Lincoln Riley literally said, you know, it's one thing to make great plays, but to be a great player, you need to do all the little things. And and not hurt the team. Like you, you need to be consistent. There's been a big theme with this this team talking about consistency, especially on that defensive line. And I don't think that Bear Alexander was given really the support he needed to shine like he's been able to now. I think you know, you guys, get ready for the name Gavin Meyer. You guys are going to hear that name a lot. Uh, things like that are going to help out Bear uh, immensely. As far as you know, uh, if Anthony Lucas takes the next big step. And, and is the guy that he was projected to be coming out of high school. And, and when he came over from Texas A&M as a five-star, then, yeah, I mean, if you, you give him the support inside, absolutely, Bear Alexander can recap. We've seen him. like We've seen his talent. There's no denying his size, his strength, his get-off, and his quick. I mean, th there's not many people are made like that. So, yeah, if he's given the supporting cast, he absolutely could have an all Big Ten type of conference. Yeah, he can do it. I think the salient point to make with uh, Bear Alexander relative to statistical predictions is that on defense, statistic, statistics can really lie, right? You know, if Bear Alexander is soaking up double teams, he's soaking up two bodies in the middle of that line, he's not going to get stats. But if that helps Anthony Lucas and Gavin Meyer and the other players on that line feast at the banquet table, then, then that's great. You know, so like, I'm definitely not going to assign a high number of statistical uh, superlatives to Bear Alexander because I don't think he's going to be a stats heavy guy. And I think that the USC defense can work really well precisely if he doesn't accumulate stats. He's just going to absorb what other offensive lines throw at him and he'll, it'll allow other guys and really tim alluded to this that bear alexander was all alone last year it was like tuli tui pelotu was all alone two years ago in 2022 it's it's having four guys five guys if you want a burger four guys if you want an elite uh defensive line and so really that's the key it's four guys all doing their job so no one cares who gets the, the sack who gets the TFL just as long as they're making the splash plays and they're making the fundamentally sound plays. Bear Alexander might be a statistical zero, but it could, it could mean that he's the MVP of the defense. I think the, the goal, I think the goal is not to have him that, I mean, I get you, you're interior defensive tackles. You're not going to be racking up the sacks like other positions usually get. But my point is, is I think the goal of this defensive staff is not to make him the guy that's just sitting there holding. They want someone else to demand that double team to get Bear. I mean, maybe they bring in a, a running back to chip. That's fine. That's one less guy that's going out. I'm saying is they want to allow Bear to not consistently be drawing that double and even triple teams sometimes. So, I mean, that's what you want, Matt. You want, you want a guy next to him that's going to demand the respect, like the evolution of, you know, uh, an Anthony Lucas. You know, the... the, the um, emergence of Gavin uh, Meyer coming in. You want to see that happen. A Kobe Pepe that maybe who's been beating him, reports are he's been beating some guys and he's been a, a plug in that spot where you're taking on two guys and being that guy just holding a gap, letting Bear get loose. That's what we want to see. So, go on, Mark. What do you got to say? Got a little smirk going. 
Well, I, I'm just amused at Roger Dodger's comment here about just just if the defensive line lines up correctly, it's going to bring him to tears. Let me let me retrace. Go back to the Big Ten uh, training camp show on on uh, Big Ten Network over the weekend. Danton Lynn and also the the analyst Jerry DiNardo and Yogi Roth, they all agree. Anthony Lucas looks the part. They 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 uh, I, DiNardo and Roth in particular. They both said Anthony Lucas looks the part from what they observed of USC. So, I mean, like if if Anthony Lucas is has a season that flows in concert with and from uh, the the preseason from the camp that he's having. And that that just raises the ceiling and that plays into what Tim said that, you know, whoever is next to Bear Alexander has to be a stud like then then doors open literally and figuratively uh, for that USC defensive line. Get those alleyways, those lanes to the quarterback and uh, everything uh, changes for the better. Matt, thank you so much for that, because otherwise I would have uh, missed my notes here. Anthony Lucas practice player. Meaning, can he emerge as more than a practice player and be the monster that he could possibly turn out to be on game day? All right, linebackers. How did this shake out last year? We had Mason Cobb with 85 tackles, Jalen Smith with 75. There's a question coming in from uh, our buddy Trojan Blade about Jalen Smith, I thought. Said that uh, Jalen's probably going to be. A, he, he's probably playing cornerback. He won't be a linebacker. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. I was just going through tackles, leaders. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Trojan Blade question. Uh, Bruce Feldman said that Jalen Smith has been mm -hmm. SC's best corner in camp. With that in mind, who do you see starting in the other secondary spots? I would say Covington. And then and Kamari, you know, Kamari Ramsey and uh John Humphrey, I imagine, would be would be uh would be strongly considered for starters as well. Yeah, I, I think that be, I think John Humphrey will be, and then you're gonna have a pretty fierce battle between Covington. Nicholson and and Smith. I don't. I, that's too close to call. I think. Um, and then probably uh, free. Um, yeah. So K Kamari Ramsey. And then you know, uh, same thing. Uh, their safety. You're probably looking at you know. Uh, I don't think that uh, Akili Arnold came down just to to ride the bench. I think he's going to get some strong play. Um, Anthony Beers shined a little bit. I mean, I, again, the, the secondary is going to be interesting as well. Uh, it's, it's. They even talked about it. Belk was kind of cagey. He was talking about, you know, who who was looking good and who's going to be starting, and he didn't really give a definitive answer. And I'll tell you what, you see a lot of guys flying around out there, and they've been a lot of different combinations. So it's it's that's probably going to be a game time decision. Greedy Vance, the Florida State transfer, being mentioned there. I bet you he's 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 he's, I mean, he's etched his way into nickel. He's been they refer to him as as sticky. And anytime your your coaches are saying you're sticky, and your cover skills, and uh, he coming over from Florida State, yeah, he looked hungry and and he's been playing great at practice. So yeah, let's hit the super chat from DML. DML, thanks for the ten dollar super chat. We really appreciate it here at the Voice of College Football. Should Power 5 allow inter-squad scrimmages like the NFL due to changes in the game, USC could practice against San Jose State so the coaches can see the team against different schemes. Well, DML, I, I think there's a reason why this doesn't happen. And I go back to the most violent football game I've ever seen. The, the one football game in which I literally did fear for the safety and physical well-being of the team that was getting thrown around like a rag doll on the field. Mark knows the answer. Mark knows where I'm going with this. As I've mentioned it before here at the Voice of College Football, the Sugar Bowl between Hawaii and Georgia, 2008. Like, I thought those poor kids from Hawaii were going to all get concussed and sent to the infirmary. Like, that, I, I really thought that, you know, kids were, were their, their, their well-being was in danger. I really did 
think that when, when I watched that game, like like skulls were just getting pounded. Like I, I was I was fearing for the safety of every Hawaii player uh, on that field. So when you the point being DML that when you get a, a big Cadillac blue blood program going up against a smaller uh, program, you invite disparities in physical overall development resources, et cetera, et cetera. You know, maybe you would do it with two power fives, um, you know, and like, you know, since Stanford and Cal are now in the ACC, maybe you do a USC Stanford or a UCLA Cal scrimmage. Okay. But, you know, the, it, the point to underscore is that you do have differences in terms of the size, the, the weight, the heft, the depth, the resources. That's why I think uh, you don't see that in college football. So what you say makes total sense, Matt, and we want the players to be protected. However, uh, I'm going to put a condition on this, but I'm going to bring up that obviously these games are played all over the country every week between the power fives and the group of fives. Now, are we thinking that if this is a training camp situation and there are jobs on the line, that these power five players are going to be, you know, out for blood because they're they're fighting for a position is that your thought i mean it's a it's a possibility like that wasn't at the forefront of my mind i'm just thinking about the differentials between you know an, an, a top flight program and a lower tier mountain west program you know or power you know if you do power five versus mid-tier group of five like would you want an sec team and a sunbelt team in a, in a scrimmage uh, yeah, I don't know. Like it just, it just seems like uh, something where if you're going to do that, you put a Sun Belt team against a Conference USA team, or does Conference USA even exist? Uh, maybe Sun Belt against MAC. Um, you know, so like if you're going to do it, I think you'd have to be careful about doing it, and I don't think you could do it Power Five versus uh, or Power Four now, right? Power Four versus Group of Five. I don't think. You'd want to go down that road too many times. Or because of travel situations, you could have conference teams playing each other that do not play each other in the regular season. So we we skipped to the secondary. My issue there, I was running down tacklers, and then it made me think of Trojan Blades' comment about uh, Jalen Smith impressing in camp. So we skipped to the secondary. We'll go back to the linebackers. Uh, Tim, I know that you've made comments concerning Mason Cobb not necessarily being at his best last year and that we may see a improved Mason Cobb or what he was in Oklahoma state uh, in the big 12. I just don't think he was placed in a position to be very successful. As a matter of fact, I don't think many, many players on that defense were placed in a position to be very successful. That became evident a long time ago, but really evident, you know, as that season carried on, which led to Alex Grinch being let go. Uh, the guy was an all-conference player at at Oklahoma State. Um, had had some great plays and shine in the backfield as well. But uh, I think that the, if you're talking about someone who's probably to lead the team in tackling, that's probably go to Issa Macarena's uh, Arnold. Uh, he's he's probably going to be your guy. He he shined up at um, at Oregon State. Uh, Trojan fans that don't know about him already, you'll get to know a lot about him uh, this season pretty early on. I can't remember if it was if it was Matt Entz or if it was Danton Lynn, but basically said this is the prototypical linebacker, uh, especially with the Mike position. I think with the USC linebackers, just in terms of you know who's going to be team leaders this year, I think it's going to be pretty clear cut. Mason Cobb tackles, Eric Gentry pass deflections. Uh, I don't, and I don't know if we I don't know if we differentiate between deflections and pass breakups. Like I think pa pass breakups might be like at the point of the catch. I think I'm I, I'm f framing deflections as being different. Like uh, you're just you're tipping an in-flight pass before well before it gets to the receiver. So like you know uh, Jalen Smith uh, or Greedy Vance might be the leader for pass breakups, but I think Eric Gentry is going to be the leader in deflections. You know, before, well before it gets to a receiver uh, far, farther down uh, the field. So, th th like, those are the two statistical leaders for the linebackers. Which is uh, oddly one of my favorite plays in football. 
I love to see a big defensive end get his mitts up there and bat a ball in the air. Uh, I, I just enjoy that. Uh, Harkening back to Ed Tutal Jones doing that with the Dallas Cowboys more than anyone in the NFL at the time. Is there anything else uh, from the linebackers or secondary that you guys wanted to hit on in regards to any statistical breakdowns, interceptions, or likewise uh, Mason Cobb, the leading tackler, according to Matt, and uh, EMA for me. Gentry passes defensed. Yes. And then, uh, Tim, you went with uh, Mascarenas Arnold as the leading tackler. Of course, that's what he was at Oregon State. I think in the I think in the secondary, uh, either Jalen Smith or Greedy Vance as the leader in interceptions, um, and I would say you know Kamari Ramsey probably will, he won't lead the team in tackles, but I'd say he m- might lead the secondary uh, in tackles. Your last comment, Matt, uh, concerning the health of the LSU team, and not necessarily trying to make too much out of that, but again, it's more about development and learning the scheme and doing all the things that make these teams sharper and ready for the the opening game than it is the health that we're going to see two weeks from now. I went to FanDuel to look at the line for the game. Just curious to see if maybe there's been a movement at all. So that was a full touchdown a couple months ago at seven points for LSU. Five and a half. LSU is now just a five and a half point favorite. I should have uh, scarfed up the seven when I could. Yeah, it does seem as though, you know what? It's interesting. Public opinion is moving toward USC in both the LSU and Michigan games, right? A couple months ago, where the Vegas line was, it's moved about one and a half to two points toward USC for each of those games. So that is really interesting. Now, what's funny about that? is that, and I'm not saying this about this specific game at all, so nobody take me out of context here. I'm making a broad generalization, but our buddy Steve Merrill at Wager Talk says that is usually a bad indicator that the public typically doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, he says it more eloquently and has 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 metrics to back it up, uh, but that's usually, you, you don't want to go with the public. No, you want to go at the end. When the money moves to the end, that's when you know what you've got going. College football is even more exciting with some action on the line. And the games are even better when you're cashing in. And the voice of college football is the place to be to get the greatest value. Let's start with my picks. 75% against the money line, 58% against the spread. I've got a 40-year track record. In fact, in 2023, at $100 played per game, you would have netted over $9,300. And guess what? I'm just the warm-up act. Steve Merrill, our ace in the hole, show stopper from Wager Talk, six years with the voice of college football, over 30 years in the industry. Steve gives us analysis on all the big games, but you can't miss Steve's weekly under the radar pick, which went 21 and 5 against the spread the last two seasons. I repeat, 21 and 5 against the spread. You also get picks from some of our top analysts here at the Voice of College Football, including Steve Dace and Matt Zemick. Become a YouTube channel member or Patreon member for just $99 per month. Go to the main channel on YouTube, click join, and select the betting tier. Do the same thing on Patreon. Make 2024 a winner now. 